Okay guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Lesson 26, Acts chapter 26. You know, I think for me, what, what I've loved about the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit, I mean, what we are seeing is, and we've talked about this many times, is that here Jesus models this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He models what he's asking them to do, but then in, in the book of Acts, they're actually doing it. They're actually walking this thing out. And you've heard us say this before, whether it's through Wesley, Sean, or our team over the last couple weeks. I mean, the, the one word is authority. As we walk, are we walking with the authority of Christ? And why is this important? Because this walking has been a three, three journeys, at least the first, second, and third missionary journey. Paul is going through this adventure of truly interacting with the Jews, arguing, defending, <laughs> and then he eventually just says, heck with it, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And in fact, you know, three times in the book of Acts, you see this Damascus Road experience that you hear about it. In Acts 9, you're going to see about it for the very first time. And then in Acts 22, and then guess what, guys? Oh, yeah, I get to teach on it again for the third time. <laughs> It's almost like the Old Testament, the Israelite cycle. It's like, I've already taught on this. I've already taught on this. Oh, oh, I've already taught on this for the third time. And I say that because remember, just maybe if it's in the word three times, maybe he really wants us to get this. And, and Paul's mission is pretty special. In Acts 9, 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument. Remember, he's talking to Ananias. I need you to go to Ananias. I need you to pray over him, brother Saul. I need you to release the scales that are over his eyes. He's got an incredible mission. This man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles. Watch this. To, to Gentiles, kings, and the Israelites. Why I wanted to launch off with Acts 9.15, because it really serves as a hinge, an understanding of Acts 25 and where you're headed into Acts 26. Paul was put before kings and governors, and I think if you would, Kevin, would you go to Acts 25? We'll jump in to verse, verse 26. Obviously, Paul is before King Agrippa. And 25, 26 says, I have nothing definitive to write, uh, definite, excuse me, to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I brought him before all of you. It's kind of an interesting comment right there. All of you. Uh, the audience isn't as big as what they say. And especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this examination is over, I may have something to write. And Scripture continues on. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner and not to indicate the charges against him. Well, amen. He finally has something right here. And so if you would, go to Acts 26, verse 1. So in Acts 26, 1, it says, Agrippa, King Agrippa, said to Paul, It is permitted for you to speak for yourself. For yourself. So then Paul, out of honor, out of recognition and salutation, he stretches out his hand and he begins his defense. And it's constantly, isn't this not what he's been doing? I mean, even in Acts 22, we even talked about this. Even in Acts 24, he's constantly defending himself before either the religious or the governmental officials. And so he says in verse 2, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa. Now, just so you know, we would expect something, wouldn't we, Kevin, normally? Like, normally we would expect this, you know, I really like your shoes, King Agrippa. I really like what you're wearing. I really like how, I really like the peace that's going on in the kingdom. He has this whole sucking up, kissing up mentality. And, you know, We've learned that about the Apostle Paul, but I think it's actually of the Lord. But right here, he doesn't do that. He says that today I'm going to make a defense before you about everything I'm accused of by the Jews. Oh, no, just kidding. Watch the next verse. Especially since you're an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies. So I'm just telling you guys, if you're coming before people, you need to learn how to talk before these people. And over and over again, they're always positive first. They're always speaking life into the situation. So he realizes that King Agrippa is clearly an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies. He understands and he knows, and I think this is crazy, doesn't say this here, but Kevin, can you go to Acts 26, verse 27? King Agrippa, okay, and he doesn't pull that card right here. He pulls it at the end. Remember we talked about the positives? You know how you do it at the beginning, at the end? Hey, by the way, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. I just know that when Paul is speaking to King Agrippa, he knows because he has ties to the Jewish roots of understanding the cultures and the customs, he can probably speak into King Agrippa more than King Agrippa even knows himself. We can get into that. And there's, there's a fine line here about attacking this because if Agrippa says, I believe in the prophets, uh, he has to, to to appease the Jewish people. But then if he says, I believe in the prophets, <laughs> it's the same thing, then he might have to actually listen to the Apostle Paul. It's actually a no win on this one. So at the very beginning, he says, look, man, I understand you know about the Jewish uh, religion. I know that you understand about the Jewish culture. And so what you're going to see in verses four and on is really what, and I love what Wearsby said. 
is that there's five key statements. That's all there is. There's five key statements that Paul says in his defense to King Agrippa. Okay, now remember, it is going to feel redundant. I have no problem saying this. It's going to feel like Acts 9. It's going to feel like Acts 24 or Acts 22. It's going to feel like, man, I just, I know I've heard this before. Yes. And for some reason, Luke wanted us to understand this three times. Uh, if it was Peter, I'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but this is the life of Paul. So here's one. One of the very first statements that you're going to see is, and it's going to jump down all the way into verse 5, but uh, don't go there yet. First phrase is this. I lived as a Pharisee. Okay, you're going to see, start seeing some of these phrases and it's going to come through verses 4 through 11. So starting in verse 4, it says this, all the Jews, they know my way of life from my youth, right? We've already talked about this, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem. And in verse 5, let me just back up, okay? Well, let's go to verse 5 and then we'll go somewhere else. Uh, they had previously known me for quite some time. If they were willing to testify that according to the strictest party of religion, I lived as a Pharisee. So Kevin, if you would, just go to Acts 23, verse 6. A couple things. Uh, again, just this mentality of I lived as a Pharisee. Now look how he's described. Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. So he clearly identifies himself as a Pharisee. He identifies himself as a son of Pharisee. And then can you go to Philippians 3, verse 5? If you go to Philippians 3, verse 5, again, it's this mentality of uh, Philippians 3, verse 5. It just says, Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee. He's, re he's referencing, I'm a devout Pharisee because of the regarding the law. So I think it's pretty clear to say, again, this backdrop. Remember, we've talked about this. In identifying how Christ has changed your life, you've got to understand where, where you've come from. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. I lived as I lived as a, as a Pharisee. Scripture then says in verse uh, 6, And now I stand on trial. And I love this phrase. In fact, Sean Carlson, who was teaching this week as well, we talked about this, for the hope of the promise. I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Now, Wearsby breaks this down, this hope of the promise. It's really because of his belief in two things. One for sure is the resurrection. And the second one is the hope of, of Israel. So because I believe in the resurrection of Christ, and by the way, I believe that Israel still has a future. So now kind of let's, let's unpack this just a little bit. So he's on trial, okay, because of a couple things. Paul was not being judged because he had done something wrong. He had not turned against his own Jewish heritage. Remember this. Instead, this is really key. He believed in the promises that God had made to the nation of Israel. And here are two essential promises. One is, the promise of a coming Messiah. I believe that the coming Messiah is coming back. I believe that. And then I actually believe in the reestablishment of the kingdom of God. So I believe in the Messiah and I believe that the establishment, reestablishment of the kingdom of God. And because of that, Paul doesn't actually reject the hope of salvation for Israel. But that's the problem. He actually saw the hope that was fulfilled through the life, the death, and, and the resurrection of Christ. You see, Jesus came back to give life to all of the believers, and because he believes that, he's standing on the hope of the promise, they don't like that. They don't want to stand for this. They don't want to embrace this. And he even says, you guys, I lived as a Pharisee. I lived as what you were communicating. And so much so in verse 7, he says, the promise, this is the promise, you guys, the hope of the promise that he's talking about, it's the promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day. Like to me, this is a, an awesome prophetic picture of verse six and seven. He says, look, I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the, in the coming kingdom. And oh, by the way, this is a promise to who? What does it say, Kevin? To what tribes? To all 12. To 12 tribes. Now we're not just talking about the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes. We're talking about all 12 tribes. And, and Paul says, it's for all of them. Kevin, can you go to Matthew 19, verse 28, please? Scripture just talks about this. Even, even Jesus is talking about this. He said, I assure you, in the Messianic age, when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, even Jesus is talking about, yes, the future that's coming to the 12 tribes. Can you go to James 1, verse 1? I think a lot of times when we get into the New Covenant, get into the New Testament, it's kind of like, ah, Whatever about the 12 tribes. It's almost like, oh yeah, the church has replaced Israel. No, no, we haven't. 
In fact, in James, he's saying, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. You know what that means? This is written to the 12 tribes, these Jewish people that have dispersed. God has a plan and a, and, a, and a purpose. And Paul says this hope of the promise is intended, yes, even for these 12, 12 tribes. Kevin, that makes sense to you? Mm-hmm. And so what I love is, is it says at the end of verse 7 in Acts 26, King Agrippa, I'm being accused by the Jews because of this hope. But yet the reality is, is this hope is coming to you. This hope that we've been talking about in all of the Old Testament, it's coming to the 12 tribes. I believe in this and now I'm being accused because I embrace this hope. Why is it considered in verse 8 incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself, Scripture says, supposed it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus Nazareth. Remember, I am and I was a Pharisee. In fact, in verse 10, he says, I actually did this in Jerusalem. I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. I was against this hope. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. In all the synagogues, I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them. I even pursued them to foreign cities since I was greatly enraged at them. That's why I was headed to Damascus. I had letters so I could crush you. I mean, that's the language. That's the thoughts behind the Apostle Paul. So now that's, that's the one statement. Now there's going to be four more key statements that Wearsby identifies that Paul clearly says in Acts 26. And the second statement that you have here is he says, okay, not only did I live as a Pharisee, but then it says, he also said, I saw a light. It's going to go in verses 12 through 13. In verse 12, it says this, I was traveling to Damascus under these, circumstances, under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priests. Now remember this, you guys. <laughs> He's on his way as a Pharisee to go after the same people that he has become today. In King Agrippa, verse 13, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun. I don't even know how that's possible, to be honest. Shining around me and those traveling with me. So he says, I saw a light. Now, now this light, you guys, I mean, I think it, it can only be an act of God. And I love it. It's, just an, it's an interesting perspective that as Paul stands before King Agrippa, I mean, he, he's recognizing the king is an expert in Jewish affairs. He knows that he's interested in this case. And the only thing he can say is, is man, I, this was of the Lord. Okay, so you have two, two uh, descriptions that Paul says to Kevin. Who's, who's he talking to? Do you remember? King Agrippa. King Agrippa. He says, I lived as a Pharisee. I saw... A light. And then it says in verse 14 through 18, here's your another phrase here. He says, I heard, I heard a voice in verses 14 through 18. So he saw something and now he heard something. It says in verse 14, we all fell to the ground and I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language. I, I love that, by the way. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What in the world does that mean? Well, let's kind of unpack this, shall we? Let's begin to unfold this. All right, we're going to talk about this. Nelson really breaks this down for me pretty clear. A young ox, okay? Kevin, you can use your, your background and your egg if you, know, you need to fix some things here. When, when a young ox is first yoked, okay, it, it usually resents the burden. What, what are we even talking about when it's first yoked, Kevin? First time you'd put... a. Uh harness on them or a yoke they wouldn't know what to do they're going to resist it and they're like kicking their way out of it they don't want it on them and if the if the ox was yoked to a single hand plow okay the plowman would then here's what he would do he would hold a long staff with a, with a sharpened end close to the heels of an ox and in this process every time the ox uh, every time the ox would like kick, every time the ox would break off, it would just, it hit the spike. And so it kind of kept it in line. So every time it wanted to rebel, they'd hit that spike and man, they'd, they'd stay the course. So if an ox was yoked to a wagon, here's what would happen is that there'd be a studded bar with wooden spikes and it served the exact same purpose. Every time you got on a line, it was like this little poke. It's actually a sharp poke. And here's the point of this. And what I, I really like this picture for me. The point was is that the ox had to learn submission to the yoke the hard way. Like it's not easy. 
And so think about this, you guys. There's this image of every time the ox got off, it got, it got persecuted. It got poked in order for it to fall in line and submit. Before the Damascus Road experience, Paul was constantly resisting. After the Damascus Road experience, he welcomed the pokes. He actually welcomed the suffering. And he says, Saul, why, why are you fighting this? Why is it hard for you to embrace this? Because it's, it's coming. Scripture continues on in verse 15. And then I said, well, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I, I am Jesus. Well, that's an awesome answer, by the way. Who are you? I'm Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. And so what I want you to do is I want you to get up and what you're going to see in 16, 17, and 18 is you're going to begin to see Paul's mission in life. Actually, like this is what he's been asked to do. Here's what I want you to do, Paul. I want you to get up. I want you to stand on your feet. Remember, I heard a voice. This is what he's hearing in this process. He's been blinded. Now he's hearing. He says, I've appeared to you for this purpose. Wouldn't you love to have God just say, Kevin, this is your purpose in life right here. I mean, this is your calling. Rich, this is what I unfold. This is what Jesus does for Paul. He says, here's the purpose. To appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and what I will reveal to you. In verse 17, I'm going to ask you to do something, Paul. I will... I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them. And here's Paul's purpose. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What an awesome picture. Paul is being asked to go from a Pharisee <laughs> to experiencing the light, to hearing from the Lord. And when you begin to look at this picture of, of really what, what this could look like, Paul, by the way, I need you to receive the inheritance. And I want other people to do that as well. And so here you have, Paul says, uh, and he's talking to King Agrippa. I've lived as a Pharisee. I saw the light. I heard a voice. And there's, there's a drastic shift here. And I know this sounds obvious, you guys, but many times people are here and it isn't until you encounter Christ that, Nothing else is going to make sense. So when you get into verses 19 through 21, here you go. And I love this language that he uses. He says, therefore, King Agrippa, there's the name again. In the dialogue, he uses names over and over. And when you read scripture, this is what happens. And people are like, what? what's the names matter? Look what Paul does. So here you go. He just says, I was not disobedient. So in verses 19 through 21, you have... I was not disobedient. So he says, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to what? The heavenly vision. To the light and to what I heard. Instead, I actually preached to those in Damascus first. So those that I went to kill, I'm now preaching to. And to those in Jerusalem and all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me because I wasn't disobedient to the vision that God asked me to do, even if it made zero sense. And I want to just go to verse 20 if we can, Kevin, just for a second. I mean, one of the messages that Paul does is he talks about a works worthy of repentance. He wants people to begin to, and we've heard this, change their thinking, change their mindset from a Pharisee to a follower of Christ, from a Sadducee to a disciple of Jesus. This repentance is, it's a renewing of, even as it says in Romans 12 too, it's a renewing of the mind. And I can't think of a better picture than Saul becoming Paul. In fact, Wearsby says it this way, genuine, genuine repentance is evidenced by genuine behavior. Genuine repentance is evidenced by genuine behavior. I mean, that, that's the basics, you guys. Whenever people say, oh man, I'm so sorry and I repent of all my sins. And then what do they do? The next week they do it again. That's not called a repentant heart. It's not called a repentant mind. And so what you see with Paul in the first four statements is, I, I lived as a Pharisee. I saw a light. He's talking to King Agrippa. I heard a voice and I was not disobedient. When you get into verse 22, it says this, to this very day, that you're going to be your fifth and final statement. And I'm going to write it a little bit differently. I continue uh, unto this day. 
It's going to go verses 22 through 32. Kevin, when it says, I continue unto this day or to this very day, without even talking through this, what comes to your mind? Uh, just the change, because of the change that I sp of the previous points, I haven't wavered f even till today. You can go ahead, call this super cheesy, but here's your stoplight. I mean, this is, this is the reality. Paul has continued to go ever since he received the vision. Like, he just kept going. Nothing stopped what Paul was doing. And in fact, if you go to Luke 9, verse 62, Kevin, Luke 9, verse 62, it says this. It says, but Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, I just want to just say, once you've received a vision from the Lord, once you've heard from the Lord, if you go back, Jesus says, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. I don't know, Rich, I want to get you to chime in here on this. Kevin, like when it says you look back and you're not fit for the kingdom of God, what, what does that even mean? I think that's, it's easy, to, it's easy to look back and say, well, I was being blessed there and I enjoyed that a lot more than what I'm, I, I think, I mean, Paul's in prison at this point. It'd been pretty easy for him to say, well, if I'm going to end up in prison, I don't, I'm just going to give that up, so. And we know it, that he doesn't do that. In fact, for two years, he actually does more. <laughs> he's talking, he's advancing the kingdom of God. And he says, to this very day in Acts 26, 22, uh, it says, I have obtained help that comes from God. And I stand and I testify to both small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. In other words, by the way, I'm just quoting what you guys have been reading. I'm just quoting the Pentateuch. I'm just quoting the Torah. I'm just quoting the Old Testament. And so I've actually been obedient to what I've heard. And in verse 23, if you want one verse that describes the gospel message, this is it. It's a succinct, it's simple, it's to the point. And he says, here's the message, that the, the Messiah must suffer and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. It's the gospel message. Christ has to go through this and oh, by the way, he's gonna come back to life and in this process, he's gonna proclaim light to our people. Who's our people? The Jews. He's gonna proclaim light to the people and to the Gentiles. Very similar to 1 Corinthians 15, verse three. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse three, it says, for I passed on to you as most important what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then in verse four, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You know what I love about going back to Acts 26, verse 23? There, there's not a whole lot of controversy there. Doesn't talk about the gifts. Doesn't talk about the gift of knowledge or tongues. It doesn't talk about hymns. It doesn't talk about songs. It doesn't talk about signs. Guys, it's the gospel message. And then, oh, by the way, the gospel message is proclaimed to the Jew and to the Gentile. If only we could get this in our churches. This is the message we need to procure. This is the message we need to communicate. Look, this wristband, like all this does for me is it just says, would you remember Acts 26, 23? Would, would you just remember that because of the sin and the death, Christ died for us. And then the scripture just says, if you have faith in him that he came back to life, you get life. And the reason we have it on a wristband, the reason that we have it here on a wrist is so that we would then begin to be the light to share this to the Gentiles around us. This is Paul's message. This is Jesus's message. And he says, look at this. I continue unto this day. So the minute that you saw the light, we talked about this a couple days ago, you guys. The minute that you had an encounter with Christ, and it doesn't have to be a road to Damascus experience. It doesn't have to be this crazy uh, light show. It could just mean the moment that you realize you've gone from death to life, praise God, you saw the light. Praise the Lord, you heard the voice because the Spirit of God was speaking to you. And, and in this, uh, he's asking us to not be disobedient. In fact, he's asking us to walk out the Great Commission. And it's funny, and it's kind of almost comical. In verse 24, as he was making this defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice. Now, wait a minute. I thought he was talking to King Agrippa. Festus chimes in. He says, you're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. And I was like, whoa, there's the Revive School theme verse. Yeah, well, I just want to tell you this, that when you start walking and living out this thing, I don't have a problem telling you you'd be crazy. 
I don't have a problem saying you'll be a fool for Christ because you actually might believe this and it can happen in your life. You might actually start walking with ridiculous authority that can only come from Christ. And you're like, whoa, where, where did that come from? In fact, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 13, I think it's a good place to be, you guys, if you're crazy for Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 13, it says, For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we have a sound mind, it is for you. <laughs> Go to Mark 3, 20, verse 21, would you, please? If Paul is considered crazy, it's because he's embracing a crazy message. Look at his family. Mark 3, 20. Uh, go to verse 20, if you would, first, Kevin. So then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. There's a whole process there. And then when he jumped into verse 21, it says, when his family heard this, they set out to restrain him. Jesus. <laughs> hey, somebody get the white coat. They're here to restrain him. Why? Because they thought he was out of his mind. When you walk in radical authority, when you walk in obedient faith, somebody's going to say you're a nut job. Somebody's going to say you're crazy, you're a loony bird. But the reality is, is this is going to sound horrible. You're probably looking more like Christ when you, when you get accused like this. It means you're not basing anything on the world or on the flesh. It means you're basing everything on the spirit and in truth. And I love this. That's what Paul communicates. As he communicates simple, powerful truth. Yes, Kevin, if you'll go back to Acts 26, Festus comes in and says, you're crazy. And Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. <laughs> he compliments him. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth. There it is. And good judgment. For the king knows about these matters. It is to him that I'm actually speaking boldly. So Paul starts speaking with this boldness because he knows it's truth. And I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his notice since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Now watch this. I know you believe. He didn't use this card when he first started talking to King Agrippa. He used it at the end, at the end of his testimony. And then Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? There's only three times, you guys, in the New Testament that that word Christian is used. And King Agrippa is one of them. Are you trying to become, ask me to become one of you? Are you trying to get me to become a Christian? He says, I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. I want you to experience the freedom of Christ. <laughs> so the king, the governor, Bernice, gotta love her name, the sister, and those sitting with them, they got up. And when they had left, they talked with each other and said, this man is doing nothing that deserves death or chains. And then Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. You know what I love about this end story? It's the same as you guys, as when he was in, in prison for two years. He's constantly trying to convince, yes, these government officials about Christ, and he does not back down. And how does he do this? He tells them his life story, how Christ set him free and he wants anybody who listens to experience the same. All right, guys, this is uh, Acts 26. There's more to come, two more chapters. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.